Okay, let's try this one and see how it goes. Oh god. The following is an educational documentary. Alright, uh... We're covering the case of Christopher Wade and analyzing it from a legal and psychological perspective. Okay, cool. Did you get ready to kill my daughter? He said that he went out one night and he went to some girl's trailer and went in with the intention of kidnapping her. It's not that I don't feel emotional, but I keep a very tight brain on it. I used to go to high school with him. He was creepy to me. There was death, high creep deaths. Kill my goddamn sister. Two hours and Two From hours the moment until Lee was up. born, Max Porter was very protective of his little sister. The two remained as thick as thieves all throughout high school. And when Max went off to college to major in massage therapy, Lee followed him as soon as she could, even going into the same major. Unfortunately, the siblings couldn't be joined at the hip forever. And when Max moved to California after college, Lee began to struggle. She <laughs> Ray, why do you like every crime video? FBI going to visit you someday? Okay, first of all, I like... The videos we watch so that I, in the future, I know what videos we've seen. It's, it's the only way I know if we've watched a video or not, because I will forget. Okay, just, okay, FBI, don't come after me, please. Is, is it too loud? Is it? I'll turn it down a smidge. He fell behind in school and eventually dropped out. At 19, she began a relationship with a 38-year-old man named Jesse. According to interviews with Jesse, it was while dating him that Lee found herself immersed in a world full of parties, drama, and heroin. This went on for months, with Lee's friends and family noticing her rapid decline into addiction and depression. In May of 2014, Lee made a concerning post on Facebook. Some nights, I can't sleep. I end up staying up all night thinking of all the things in my life I f***ed up. You'd think after trying really hard to get back up on my feet and actually doing it, I'd be proud of myself, but nope. I simply can't get out of this state of depression. I would love it if someone would talk to me right now Aww. with an open mind and heart. Lee's DMs were soon filled to the brim with people reaching out to help her. One of the many friends and family members who That's reached so out was a man named Christopher Wade. No. The two had known each other in high school, but hadn't been incredibly close. Regardless, Chris reached little, out and told Lee that if she ever needed someone to talk to, he was always there. Seeing him as someone who cared about her well-being, she began confiding in him about the struggles she'd been going through. Jesse was planning on moving away in order to get clean, meaning Lee was about to be homeless. She also told him about her struggles with addiction. Despite the bad choices she'd made, Lee wanted nothing more than to get her life on track, and she was determined to get sober. Eager to help his friend, Chris offered to be her accountability partner on her journey to sobriety, and he even offered to help her move into a friend's house on June 3rd. With some hope for the future, Lee was looking forward to June 3rd and getting her life on track. However, the date came and went, and those closest to Lee realized that no one had heard from her in over 24 hours. While it might be normal to go days without hearing from a friend or relative, Lee always kept in contact with people, and she would update her Facebook page multiple times a day. Facebook. Silence from her can only mean one thing. Something was terribly wrong. The last thing Renee, Lee's mother, had heard from Lee was that she was planning on going to Chris's apartment on the 3rd. Renee called Chris to ask if Lee was with him, and he told her that Lee had left his apartment on the 3rd and had gotten into a mysterious truck. Not thinking much of it at the time, Chris informed Renee that he hadn't heard from Lee since she left his apartment, and he was shocked to learn that no one else had either. With no sign of Lee anywhere, Renee got the police involved, and Facebook groups were quickly organized to help find any information regarding Lee's location. After a week with no sign of her anywhere, the police began interviewing those closest to Lee to see if they could Thanks, shed Jennifer. some light on what may have happened to her. Eager to find like her, YouTube Chris spoke the police in the hopes that maybe he could help them track down the mysterious truck he had seen Lee get into. The following mostly never-before-seen footage has been analyzed by a qualified team, including a licensed attorney, a licensed clinical psychologist, and a licensed professional counselor. So I understand that Lee actually came and spent some time with you. Yes. Kind of repeated that story at nauseum, so yeah. I'm not going to go through yeah. a lot of details as to that because I've read the reports. And yeah, you went through pretty much in detail with Detective Lopez this morning about how you know she started messaging you back and forth on Facebook in the last couple yeah. of weeks. And stop me if I'm wrong and correct me if I'm wrong, but let me just summarize this a little bit. She had been messaging you, telling you that her relationship was going bad, asked you about maybe having a place to stay. Um, you agreed to let her do that. Yeah, Is that correct. Yes. Why would she ask you? 
um, ways to say. She didn't ask me. I offered it to her. Okay. Um, and as far as it wasn't that it was going bad, that she, it was that she had already broken up with her boyfriend. Um, I asked her if she needed a place to stay or if she needed money or anything like that. She never asked me for money, but she did initially take me up on uh, having a place to crash for a while until she got back on her feet. As soon as detectives begin questioning Chris on his relationship with Lee, his hand comes up to his face. This could be a sign of discomfort and self-soothing, which detectives will likely take note of. However, being in an interrogation in front of police would make anyone uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah true. Why would you be so generous and offer to watch your... Yeah, maybe I'm a little it's uncomfortable. Drug user. Um, I guess the best answer to that would be is because she's a friend. And... I'm extremely loyal to my friends. If any of them, even the ones I haven't spoken to in years, were to ask me for it, I'd give them a shirt off my back. Chris starts out his response by saying, I guess the best answer would be. This seems to imply that he's not just answering, but instead, he's thinking about the best way to answer and the way that would be the most acceptable to the detectives. The truth would likely be a bit of niceness mixed with a bit of self-serving motivation. While this is a completely standard motivation for helping someone, Chris is clearly worried that this might make him look suspicious. His words here are likely a slip-up, as they show he's more interested in giving the best answer rather than the truth. I was, I asked her, you know, where am I meeting you so we can go and get the, uh, so we can go and get your stuff and get you moved in. I tried asking her several times on that, but she never really uh, replied to that. She would always change the subject. Did she ever get mad at you and act like you were crying? No. Not, not to my knowledge. So during this most recent time... They haven't kind of mentioned anything about tarot cards yet, so I'm kind of curious how, how well, that plays in. Very impressed, though. Then around 1 o'clock, we went over to... The Unless Park they didn't, I missed it. Nice, I can share it. And during this time you were with her, did she talk about her drug problem at all? Um, you know, I, I asked her how she was doing, and she said she was doing good, and then... Uh, she hadn't had any temptations or had been using it again. They haven't, okay. It like she, had been high, was, she was high at that time? Not really. It seemed, now that I think about it, that she was more coming down off of it. Chris states that he believed Lee might have been coming down off of a high. The short-term effects of coming down would be an elevated heart rate, elevated breathing rate, and an increased blood pressure rate, making the individual seem almost panicky. From how we've heard Chris describe Lee that day, she seemed to be calm and quiet to the point of appearing depressed. Based on this description, it seems unlikely that she was actually coming down <gasps> off a high. Oh my gosh, I forgot to tell you guys I got the results for my doctor appointment. I forgot to tell you. So it turns out that I almost have high cholesterol. I almost do. And I'm really scared because my mom has high cholesterol and high blood pressure, so I feel like I'm on that trajectory. So I feel like I have to like really be careful and like eat things that don't raise cholesterol very much. Like every Filipino. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm on that path, so I, I like really, really have to dial in. Dial in on my diet. Dieting. Oh gosh, it's it's because um, I eat a lot of salty foods, and uh, what else was it? Oh, meat. I eat a lot of meat. Yeah, oatmeal. Um, oatmeal is supposed to help with cholesterol. Um, more fruits. Um, it was like a, a salt is so good. I love salt. I love and to be to be honest like a lot of foods in the states like everything is over salted everything's over salted also oil i do my guilty pleasure is ordering out i order out a lot and the food they probably cook the oil in is probably not very good cooking oil which also adds to cholesterol <laughs> yeah so I think I have to start actually cooking. <laughs> I gotta start doing it or I'm gonna die. Time to cook. I know. I, there was a time where I actually was cooking like almost every meal. I used to actually do meal preps, but um, 
man the convenience it's it's gotten to me it's got it's it's a horrible quality to have i'm gonna be honest a very horrible quality to have um but yeah i was thinking i was like maybe we could you know invest you know pick up a couple roomy sponsors and invest in a, a chef <laughs> uh, you know to, so we could have some healthier healthier foods it'll taste better baby i'm just so bad at it i'm so bad at being consistent with cooking i don't know but yeah um so that's that was the only results from my uh my doctor's appointment that was really bad um everything else was normal uh it was like in the range but yeah high cholesterol it's coming it's coming okay oops when you said that she was depressed what did you mean by that uh she had told me she was depressed oh i am she taking more was, vitamins yeah, now I, I am depressed she texted me on tuesday morning and said i'm feeling kind of depressed can we hang out Okay. And so I said, okay. And, and, I was and then he sure killed her. Keeping, trying to keep her as uh, optimistic as possible. How are we doing? Um, I'm just, I treated her out to lunch, uh, being as courteous as possible to her, you know, asking her, you're hungry, you want something to, something to eat, some snacks, uh, something to drink when we got back. And she seemed to be somewhat receptive to that, but throughout the whole time, the smiles never went to her eyes. And, well, normal smiling will cause the eyes to start to crinkle a little bit, to squint. But when she was smiling, it was just with her mouth. There wasn't any eye movement. So what did that tell you? That, um, that... Tells me that she was. Thanks for five, Cameron. Thanks for five, gifted. That she was kind of, that she was telling the truth when she was depressed. But now that I think about it, with her coming down, it just might have been that she didn't like lying to me. Chris is a student of criminal justice at Everest College, so this observation may be something he picked up in a class on nonverbal oh. communication and behavioral analysis. Though it also indicates that he was watching her very closely. Yeah, he was. That afternoon after you've eaten at the restaurant. Yeah. Paying too much attention. You're back at your place playing video games. Yes. How long did that go on for? You think? I went on for maybe uh, two hours or something. A couple hours. Yeah. Does she bring up the depression? Fifty thing? gifted from you Alien. Know, but, uh, Thank you. I still keep an eye on her. So you, you characterize her behavior then that afternoon as being depressed. Is that what you're saying? Yes. So uh, many gifted subs today. It's insanity. By stating that Lee seemed depressed, Chris appears to be leaving open the option that Lee might have taken her own life. Mm. Uh, we were just getting ready to get back into the video game, then she leaned in and kissed me. I was letting her go as far as she wanted. Then when it went to the bedroom, we kind of flipped flops between uh, who had the wheel, so to speak. Well, before you actually went into the bedroom, was there some discussion about that? Um, well, I... When she started taking off her sweater, I broke it off and I asked, are you sure about this? Is this, uh, I'm, I'm not asking you to do this. I made this very clear that I was not wanting to impose that on her or any sort of um, implication towards that. Did you ever use a condom? No, I did not. So she didn't ask you to and you didn't have one of these? I offered to, but she said no. Was there ever any concern on your part that maybe she's been pretty active and possibly you were putting yourself at risk for domestic abuse? Um, I mean, that's always a possibility with anyone you meet, but but that didn't really occur to me until after. Really? I mean, yeah. I'm a drug user who's doing drugs and no place to live. And... Well, it seemed to me from my discussions, and I know I say, I'm saying that a lot, but it looked to me from the way she was wording things and the way she was talking that she hadn't really gone that far to get drugs. And I got sort of a confirmation from this from her boyfriend who admitted to using with her for a while, but then started cleaning himself up. What is but happening? She 
didn't really like the idea. Of so she had a boy. Although the detectives don't know it yet, this statement from Chris would later play a vital part in their investigation. Oh Afterwards, no! She just asked, you know, I'm tired. Can I just pass out for a while? Oh no! And then about to, I don't know. As he speaks, Chris has been engaging in a lot of face-touching and stroking <gasps> behaviors. This kind of continuous movement can indicate doubt or uncertainty. The person might be unsure about oh, a particular idea, okay, question, or situation, and the repetitive gesture could be a self-soothing or comforting behavior used to manage stress or discomfort. Occasional chin stroking wouldn't necessarily be suspect, but Chris has constantly had his hand to his face throughout the interview. I uh, we're making that home. And I let him know that, yeah, we, <laughs> I had a guest over that we were, uh, not decent. <laughs> Chris appeared to cover his mouth here. This could be an indication that some part of this statement is either a half-truth or a lie, as sometimes people try to literally cover their lie as it comes out of their mouth. What did she say inside the bedroom then? Um, well, for the most part, she was asleep in my bed. Then, afterwards, I was out there, t I was out in the living room, we were talking, uh, now we're talking, that's my roommate's name. Then she said something that caused a uh, light bulb, and that, uh, uh, and I started thinking. Pisces, thanks for five gifted. Had that back with her that she didn't let leave her side. She went out to get something from her car. She would bring that with her. She brought the bag you're talking about. It was a purple bag, I think it was a crown royal bag. You're talking crown about royal. all the bags that they carry around for it. Yeah. My dad Special used to drink Crown Royal yeah. all the time. And, and in fact, you later looked in that bag. Yes. I Afterwards, I saw her go her. I only went through the Crown Royal bag. I so you found out while she was sleeping. Yeah. You woke her up. Yeah, I woke her up very gently. <laughs> I, uh, I apologized for, to her because I looked into the bag. What was her response to you violating her privacy? After I explained myself to her, I think she was... Annoyed that I had done it without her permission, but I think she understood where I was coming from because, um, as I told her, I was worried about her. So I just wanted to make sure that she was okay. Thanks, Tito. Notice the change in pitch and rushed way he says, okay. Make sure that she was okay. He's not being very forceful with the word, as if he knows she wasn't okay. As well, deceptive people often engage in what is known as emphasis. Emphasis could include many behaviors, with one such behavior being repetition, where the deceptive individual repeats a key point or phrase that supports what they want to instill in the listener's mind. Oh. In this case, Chris is repeatedly mentioning how he's a nice guy and was very gentle to Lee, even when he was waking her up and confronting her about her potential drug use. I woke her up very gently. I... It's possible that there was a time when Chris was not so proper and gentlemanly with Lee. Yeah. So he may want to emphasize this supposed gentlemanly side of himself in order to hide his darker side. Yeah. After, a little after too her, nice. I, hmm. She still seemed kind of depressed, but not as much. So she left you over to confront her about yes. the drug her. Yes. And she still seemed kind of depressed. So I did what I don't normally do. I, if someone asks me to do a tarot reading for them, I will do a tarot reading for them. But other than that, there's not very many people that I will ask if they would like me to do a tarot reading for them. After I laid out the cards, the first thing that popped out to me were that there were three of the major arcana. Those indicate something significant. Show me what you did. Okay, well, I mean, instead of being He brought the cards! Notes about some of Chris's past tarot readings would eventually make their way into the hands of law enforcement. His entries clearly express just how seriously he took his interpretations of the meanings behind the cards. One note in particular was especially ominous. It read as follows. The devil reversed. This is a curious card to reveal in this position. The devil represents the base nature of man, the primordial chaos as opposed to the reasonable order. The devil is known as the sin card, representing murder, lies, deceit, trickery, and other such things. It is unclear which meaning is right. Based on the position and the reversal, it could mean that I must stick to the straight and narrow. Transversely, it could mean that, in order to get the results I desire, I must do something morally wrong. In time, it seems the meaning behind the card became oh, all too clear for Chris. My gosh. Did you guys see that? The very end is it or it said, or it just means I'm going to get laid. Dude. 
Transversely, it could mean that in order to get the results I desire, I must do something morally wrong. In time, it seems the meaning behind the card became all too clear for Chris. Well, the cards I used are number two of them well. I'm about 95% sure of what the other three were. There was death, the high priestess, the three cups, ace of wands, and judgment. Well, overall, I told you that this was a very optimistic, it was one of the more optimistic readings that I had ever done. A lot of these cards, I mean, literally almost all of these cards, death accepted, are very positive cards. They don't have any sort of, uh, well, not necessarily negative meaning, but the negative meanings that they do have are not um, as significant as her, as she would come to physical harm or anything like that. So you told her it was an optimistic reading. Yeah, so I told her that based off of, you know, what the cards were saying, as well as what was, as well as what she had told me, that this, though it may not seem like it at a good time, is actually going to be very good for her. Following this statement, Chris can be seen rubbing his face, which is another sign of his possible anxiety and lack of confidence. Detectives then pivot and begin asking Chris for more information regarding the mysterious truck that supposedly picked Lee up that day. So how would somebody who contacted her and left either a message or her phone notified her or gave her a notification? How would... Is that true? Are all tarot cards like generally good cards? Death is actually a positive card. It means rebirth. Death can be a positive card. It can mean the end of something not serving and the birth of something new. No. No idea. Different meanings. Depends how you read it. Do all tarot card readers read all the cards similarly? Like how... I don't really know anything about tarot cards, but... Um... I think it could be quite entertaining. Uh, tarot cards? Tarot cards. Mm. Oh gosh. Different meanings. The cards have a meaning or indication associated with them. Depends on the deck. Get your cards read on stream? No! No way! Because then, like, people are going to be like, oh, my God, I need to kill her. <laughs> Someone is going to read my cards and be like, no, Valkyrie has to die or the world is going to end. There's going to be, uh, uh, I'm not on stream. See, I would get, I would get my palms read for fun. Like, I feel like, I feel like it's entertaining, but, um, I don't really know a whole lot about it. It's kind of like, it's kind of like how I feel about horoscopes and birth charts and stuff. Like, I find them entertaining. It's, like, fun to, like, look into and stuff, but, um, I don't really, like, I don't, I don't, like, life or death believe. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's more so just enter entertaining. But I don't like, I don't knock people that believe in it. Same with like ghosts. Like I personally don't believe in ghosts, but I don't knock anyone for believing in ghosts. Like they probably maybe have an experience where they would believe in ghosts or something. I don't know. It's just, just do it for fun. For me, for me, it's fun. That was her ride. I didn't know if she had a car or not. Um, Such a Capricorn she, thing she to say. Yeah, I always hear such a Capricorn, and like when I looked into it, I really am such a Capricorn. Like everything I've read about Capricorns is like so Capricorn. It's just so me, but it's just entertaining, you know. But it's kind of crazy how spot on it is. I'm such a Capricorn. It wasn't until. Friday afternoon, the, when her brother Max called me, the, I didn't <laughs> realize she even had a car. This is actually a lie. Lee's car was found abandoned at Chris's apartment complex. Not only does this show that Chris is being dishonest, but it also calls into question why Lee would with get an into Aquarius, a mysterious moon, truck and a Sagittarius if her rising. vehicle was with her. 
had she been okay the other houses matter moreover she said that she would she would keep that bag with her all the time she went out of her car Here, Chris is caught in another of many lies. When confronted over his conflicting statements regarding Lee's car, Chris stops talking and can be heard taking many deep breaths. Oh, first of all, nah, what do you mean, oh no, Aquarius Moon? Explain yourself. Nah, what, what, what are you trying to say? What's wrong with my moon? I mean, this is just for entertainment purposes, but like, what's up with it, huh? Those are placements, not houses. Yeah, yeah, the, the moons. Huh? What's wrong with my moon and my rising, huh? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I'm joking, unless... No, I'm joking. When individuals are anxious, the body needs more oxygen. So people will use various methods to get that oxygen such as breathing deep or sniffing. Have you ever traveled with her anywhere after that? No. Once she got in that truck and left your parking lot, you and I have seen her since. I have seen her since. Where did you go with her? The only place I went with her besides within my apartment was to Boston Market, and I showed the, uh, I showed the officers when they arrived Sniffle. the receipt for the Boston Market. You didn't go anywhere else in there? Nowhere else. Have you traveled yourself Towards the DIA, uh, uh, towards the airport at all in the last couple of days? No. Since she's left, you've not gone out that direction? No. Not I'm not going to lie, this video is a bit more boring room. than the first one. Dante Grant, 97 Grant. Yes. Have you gone east of there? Is this a good video? No, Does anyone know? I, I don't really get out all that much. Um, My cholesterol's so rising. I no! Uh, maybe once in a blue moon and have a drink at the bar. But other than that, I stay at home, I'll watch movies or work out my book or whatever. Is it gonna like here. get to the so point? So would be to get a printout from your phone's provider? I wanna Who's know like... Provider? I know it's Trackphone. It, it, it gets better? Yes. Yeah. You fell asleep, fell asleep watching this one? For every time your phone pinged okay, is, the, is there yeah, a yeah, better yeah, video yeah, on yeah, the Ulu yeah, channel yeah, that we can watch? Let me try speeding it up. Whatever. Faster. I understand. So if we traced your phone, what would it tell Notice how this is the moment that Chris decides to tidy up the cards, which is likely a grooming behavior. This suggests that Chris is feeling anxious about the information his phone may reveal about his location. Mm -hmm. Individuals may engage in grooming behaviors in order to expel nervous energy. This may take the form of grooming themselves, such as adjusting the collar of their shirt or smoothing out imaginary wrinkles from their clothes. It may the babysitter also one? Okay, we'll watch that one after this one. Such as wiping dust off the table, moving a water glass, or in Chris's case, stacking up his tarot cards. When Chris is asked about what his phone data will show, you can see him covering his mouth, which can be a sign of deception, as individuals may do this as a way of literally... I'm sorry, did, did OTV commit a crime? Is there, is there some detective work needed in the new OTV video? Okay, this is true crime day. I had my one stalling video, which was a Mr. Beast video, okay? Covering a lie. Now the detectives know the supposed it's story of what happened day. to Lee on June 3rd, it's time for them to ask Chris some hard-hitting questions. <laughs> Unbeknownst to him, they've been doing their research on him over the past These week. These criminals? Are they criminals? they discovered some very <laughs> disturbing information straight from Vicki Wade, Chris's own mother. Can you, can you fill me up and a little bit of Christopher's history growing up? Yeah, he went into the Army. How did he do it? And did some deployment time? He did some deployment time. He started having nightmares in deployment, and they sent him back. Okay. Did he get discharged? Yes. And Can people not suggest it's a joke? Charger. It's a joke. It was a medical, yeah. For psychiatric reasons? Yes. Slash and J. He said he didn't get a lot of sleep. They didn't have the barracks set up to where the night crew could sleep. I don't know if that contributed to the hallucinations. Time thinks the 50 sure gifted. Exactly what you were hallucinating. What were they um, he had hallucinations? That's what he told me. He did? Yeah, that's what Chris told me. When was that? I tried to make a J with my fingers, uh, but it didn't work out very well. With, with that hallucination? My thumbs are so double-jointed. It's double possible jointed. that the stress <laughs> from the deployment yeah, triggered Chris to experience psychosis. It's also a possibility that he faked <sighs> symptoms to get out of the military. But typically, military doctors are able to assess for malingering, which is when someone exaggerates or fakes illness. Growing up, his dad was into... And Chris found it online at a very young age. Chris was 
pretty messed up with it in high school. Okay. He stashed pictures of every sort. Um, what was he looking at? Well, I call it pretty hardcore. It was. Are you talking about like bondage stuff, or is it just strictly? No, not really bondage, just ugly stuff. No. I, I heard things from oh, the principal called me one day and said he had uh, <gasps> touched a girl inappropriate at school. How old was he then? Yeah, it was the sophomore junior year. When's the last time you talked to me, said? Um. The last time when he talked was a week ago. He was home not this past weekend, but the weekend before. And he's got a new girlfriend, and we were talking about that. And and uh, some of the concerns that I had in, in the situation. What are your concerns? Um, Game informer! Well, she, she told him that she wanted to talk to me. Um, she's pregnant, not by Chris, but by another man. And um, Chris was... The feeling I got is Chris was trying to rescue her from some of the bad boyfriends that she's had. Trying to Elder rescue Scrolls? vulnerable women seems to be a pattern with Chris. Not only did he do this with his pregnant girlfriend, but he also tried to do something similar with Lee, offering her a place to stay and some money as soon as he learned she was down on her luck and recovering from an addiction. I asked her if she needed a place to stay or if she needed money or anything like that. This grandiose complex may make Chris feel like the savior or hero who is protecting yeah, all of his women. his house was I mean, I, I, so I really appreciate you opening up to me and calling me It's up. really hard because I don't want him to get in trouble for, for the past stuff. Right. Armed with this disturbing information, it's time for detectives to confront Chris. It's time. Well, Sasuna, thanks for 20 gifted. Yeah, and, and you know, they're, they're being accusatory. The detectives the are ulting. Yeah, directed at you, and they're upset at you about this whole thing. They think you took advantage of her. Yeah. Um, and on top of that, they actually think that you did something to her. Honestly, I don't know where that's coming from from them. I mean, yeah, I don't really know the mother all that well, but well, let me tell you one place it's coming from. Okay. It's coming from family friends <gasps> specifically related to your mother. Mm -hmm. Drama. Telling people things about fantasies that you had in high school. Uh huh. Well, there wasn't anything like that concerning me. I mean, well, how about? Just fantasies that maybe you might have shared with you. Dana, thanks for 31 like, months. Thank you. And Miguel, thank you. <laughs> Honestly, my fantasy life is private. I keep that completely separate from my uh, from my normal life. And well, most people do. But yeah. this was enough that it was actually it's out there. We have people telling us now that you had fantasies in high school of wanting to kill women. What? He said that he went out one night. And we didn't know it, and he went to some girl's trailer and went in with the intention of kidnapping her and taking her. Why is it so zoomed in? The dog started barking at something, and, and, and back so up. He got and left. Did he say what his plan was to do when he kidnapped that girl? He was going to take her out in the woods well, he and kill her. From how she describes it, it seems like Vicky heard that her son was experiencing the desires of a serial killer and did nothing to intervene or get him help. While the incident with the girl in the trailer was Leslie five or six years ago, Leslie is telling Young you are slandering her Chris's name. Desire to take advantage of <gasps> slandering? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was telling the truth, okay, about my experience in the car with her. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, and I did say. First of all, I did say at the end that she did do a good job. Okay, not the slander. <laughs> Bitch, where is she? Fight me, fight me in Discord right now. Where is she at? ...of a woman never went away. He just learned that it could be hazardous to act on those desires directly. So he adjusted his method. He may have believed that by zoning in on Discord vulnerable right girls, he could live out some of his fantasies without as much risk. Okay, that was... <laughs> I remember that, but... Slash um... J. It seems unlikely that Chris wouldn't remember what the detectives are talking about, and his acting skills don't appear to be fooling them. Do you understand why? Yeah, I understand it. We have the police department and the people that here work here, and now we're looking into this uh, young lady who's missing. Mm -hmm. under, suspicious yeah, circumstances, like under suspicious circumstances in the sense that mm -hmm. she's dropped off the map, not making yeah. calls to anybody that she normally talks to almost on a daily basis. Yeah, I understand. We're getting calls and we're getting contact by the family who said, you did something to her. I don't know. I don't know you from Adam, but, yeah. but some of you people know you pretty well. So the fact that they knew what some of your fantasies were in high school. 
Yeah, that's kind of strange. How do they know about your fantasies? Did you ever have any discussions with your family about your intention? No. I. Did they ever confront you about that? Did they ever suspect that maybe you might be gay? Honestly, I'm bisexual, but there's. I'm, they don't need to know that. I and mean, that's what whatever I do with whoever I do it with is. It's my business. Now, that was never an issue with doing your parents or your family? Um, if they have any suspicions about that, they kept it to themselves. Really? Yes. Okay. Chris takes two pretty large drinks of water during this line of questioning. The department and the people that here work here and now are looking into this uh, young lady who's missing. Mm -hmm. This is often considered I mean, nonverbal communication, indicating nervousness. I mean, yeah. When a person is anxious, the fight or flight response is triggered, which can cause anyone the throat being interrogated to would be nervous. This could explain Chris's desire for water in those moments of high stress when these topics were brought up. Additionally, when some people are nervous, they will drink water or do some other kind of action to diffuse the awkwardness they may feel. The act of grabbing a cup of water in front of them allows them to focus on something else aside from the intense. <laughs> the bi community of the doesn't claim in front him. Of them. Well, Chris, I'm going to ask you right out, flat out, right now. Do you know where Leah is? And did you do something to her? I did nothing to her beyond what I've already said. And honestly, I have no idea where she is. It's important to note that Chris doesn't outright say no when answering this question. This could be an indication of deception, as straight up lying is hard for most people. Instead, by it's giving a true. vague, non answer, hard. Chris can still feel like he's partially telling the truth. The detectives will take note of this statement and He's his lack of actual the denial. Truth. We also hear him use the word honestly here. Honestly, when you put it that way, honestly, I'm bisexual, but honestly, I never told anyone my fantasies. Something that he said with increasing frequency throughout the interview. His increase in using this convincing statement is telling, as this behavior often shows up more when someone is hiding something and is desperately trying to convince someone that they're telling the truth, rather than actually being honest. Regardless of what Chris is saying to the detectives, they can tell that he's hiding something from them. So is there any reason why we would find Lee's blood in your apartment? Oh. Um, we were starting to get a little more physical. We actually bumped into each other and had a nosebleed, and she had a nosebleed, but other than that, no. Well, what do you mean other than that? She well, had a nosebleed, there's yeah. blood dripping, right? That's yeah, wild. So uh, and we cleaned it up, and it wasn't really anything. I didn't really think much of it at the time, so after she got up, I, you know, cleaned up the little bit of a mess. I mean, it wasn't a major gusher, it was just a couple of drops. Where at? Uh, it's on, on my uh, pillow. They butted heads? <laughs> I'm a little concerned, but your story about your sheets. Oh, God. Yeah. Chris begins covering his eyes in a movement known as eye blocking. This is a clear indication that he doesn't like where this conversation is going. And there's obviously something about this particular conversation oh about the God. sheets that he doesn't want to think about or hear. Uh, where are your Ew, that are? pillow was Thanks. so gross. Uh, my pillows are currently on my bed. As far as the sheets, I have no clue. I, for the most part, you know, sticking, <laughs> checking stuff in the laundry pile isn't something you really remember all that much. So it was routine. And... And it was covering the duffel bag, so when she got the duffel bag, she might have thought that was just hanging out. You don't know where your sheets are, hmm? Chris uses a selective memory statement, I have no clue, quickly followed by an exclusion qualifier for the most part. He also begins fiddling with his collar and ventilating his shirt. Though this is sometimes seen as a sign of lying, this movement is more clearly an indication of someone's anxiety as they may be growing hot or uncomfortable as their body temperature, sweat, and blood flow increase <laughs> due to stress. <laughs> That, combined with him nervously rubbing his neck, constitutes a cluster of deceptive behaviors. He's clearly feeling the stress of the interrogation here. <laughs> you didn't get rid of the sheets? No. Intentionally get rid of the sheets? Because maybe they're blood on them? No, sir. If you did, you know, no big deal. Tell us that. You know? <laughs> if you did, yeah. And because you're freaked out because there's blood on there, she's missing it, and all the people are going to think the worst. I'm ready to get rid of it. Understand, if you did, I, it's I, no big deal. Just let us know. But you can tell me, I don't know what happened to him. That I don't understand. So it that's what I really do not understand. And if I had gotten rid of the sheets, wouldn't I have gotten rid of the pillow too? Why would I keep the pillow but not the sheets? Because uh, maybe well, there was the well, blood on the pillows. No. Did it? No. The thing that can slip and bust based on the condition of your heart and pitch you in the heat all of a sudden in the middle of that experience, taking your sheets and taking them off the bed. It was afterwards, as I told as I told them before. Yeah. It was yeah, afterwards. Yeah, I mean, I think, I can use the restroom. The thing's kind of bizarre that all of a sudden I got to take the sheets off of my bed. 
Oh. You, you don't hear any. Yeah, yeah. Let's wait. Yeah. Your, your apartment's not exactly the tiniest. <laughs> okay. I'll be the first one to get back. So, why all of a sudden you're. That's true. Uh, you're like, bro, why do you care so much about your sheets when you live like this? What? Uh, things are not adding up here. You live like this and you're like, you know what? I should wash my sheets. You've been sleeping on this bed yeah. for hours. Would you decide, oh, now is the time that I need to pull these sheets? <laughs> it just doesn't make yeah. sense. He's like, if I can't Honestly, see them, they can't see way, me. It doesn't really make much sense to me either. Yeah. But it seemed like the thing to do at the time because I did laundry the next day, so I didn't want to forget about it. Note how Chris is rubbing his neck, face, and jaw while answering questions. These self-soothing behaviors are all signs of anxiety. <laughs> As the detective's questions begin ramping up, so do Chris's signs of anxiety. The first thing we ask each other to tell us the truth, no matter what the truth is, mm -hmm. okay? The worst thing you could do is lie to us. Absolutely the worst thing you could do is lie to us, okay? Mm -hmm. so, I understand. So, think about it again. What's the deal with the sheets? Is it actually... Is... is... When you lie, do you actually get in more trouble? Like, isn't it all the same? Like, you get the same sentencing? Regardless? Like, or are they, or are they just like, you know what, we're gonna add 10 more years because you lied. It's just an... You're screwed either way. It's just a tactic. Maybe, I guess maybe if you're more cooperative and honest, like, yeah, I did it. Maybe they won't give you as much time as they would if you were in denial the whole time. I don't know. I don't know. You lose a chance of a plea. All right, yeah, I did get rid of them. Okay. Yeah, honestly, I can't. Think of anything else. Would you be surprised to know that the sh that her cell phone went out with those sheets? Huh? Whoa! Her cell phone ended up at the same place the sheets ended up at the building. Oh my god, that's silly. I do not. Embarrassing. Honestly, I saw her leave with her cell phone. How do you know she left with her cell phone? She picked it up. It was sitting by her purse. It was sitting by her purse? Yes. Okay. Oop. By the time she gets to. Notification, as you refer to it, and the time that she walked out the door. How okay, yeah, the the difference between these detectives and the last oh. ones are night and day. Maybe uh, one two minutes tops. Oh, okay. So now the time, Chris, that you really need to be honest with us. It's time. Typically, and through the pinging of the phone, we can tell where it was taken to. Okay. So was there a problem with your sheets? <laughs> what else? This is, this is not the time to try to cover your trouble. <laughs> He's so you. stressed. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying. to find the and find the words to say because I mean Oh god so try and find the right words because uh, because I know that I have been Oh god it's so painful to watch. But yes, her phone was with the sheets. Okay. Was she with the phone in the sheets? No. Oh god. Chris it's time for you to really be honest with us now because I was no, she was not with the sheets. Is she, is she in line in the dump car? Oh, God, no. Where is she then, Chris? Is, right? Yeah, I understand it, but still, so, that's... So where is she? Honestly, I do not know. She left and got into the truck. Nobody knew where she was at, Chris. I know that. I mean, We've got her text messages. Yes. We've got her phone records. And we know everybody that she talked to that day. This man is so guilty, it's crazy. I thought that it was prearranged, okay? I thought that she had prearranged to have someone pick her up, and then... Chris, this is a place where you don't yeah, tell us what happened to Lee. This is your one and probably last opportunity to do this voluntarily. A few minutes earlier, Chris appeared to almost be in the confession body posture. Yeah, he, he's forward. almost in confession However, mode. when the detective pushed him for information, he began to adjust his story again. Perhaps if the detectives had used the tactics of asking him open-ended questions and trying to get him to tell his story without interference, he may have been close to a confession. It's possible that the detective saw Chris was almost in the confession position and <laughs> thought if they prodded him, rather than sat back and waited, that they would get the confession. 
Instead, they pushed a bit too hard, and he shut down. And I'll be accused of something. What do you think? It sounds to me like yes. And this man is having a panic attack. I maintain my innocence, but I would like a lawyer. No! So by doing that, which you've now done, we almost you got him, boys. We uh, almost got him. Proper interview with you. Yes, I know. And I will give you a business card, and I'm going to tell you not to get out of town. No, I'm going to tell you that if you want to re initiate any conversation with us from here on out, yes. you're the one that's going to have to do that. I understand. With that, Chris is given a business card and is allowed to leave the station. Over the course of the next six days, the detectives continue their investigation into Chris, collecting as much evidence as possible in order to secure an arrest warrant. However, before a warrant could be secured, the police received a shocking 911 call. What? 911? Uh, yes, I'd like to confess to Okay. What happened? It's, the case being handled by detectives, uh, He's confessing? The case being handled by detectives Lopez and, and Lynch. By detective Lopez and detective Lynch? Yes. Where are you at? We got um, him, boys. I'm at it's that easy. It's on K Street. I don't know the crossroads, but we, uh, put, uh, on... You're near the pond? Yep. What is your name? Detectives were stunned. Less than a week ago, Chris had been adamantly denying that he had anything to do with Lee's disappearance. And now here he was, confessing to her murder. What why did he do it? As and why did it change? By detectives during Chris's first interview, Lee's family were desperate to find out what happened to her. Max, Lee's older brother, knew that Chris was somehow involved in his sister's disappearance, and he was tired of waiting for the police to make their arrest. So he took matters into his own hands. In an interview conducted on the same day as Chris's 911 call, Max described how he and Jesse, Lee's ex-boyfriend, worked together to discover the Whoa. truth. The last couple of days, me and Jesse have been playing buddy-buddy with him over text, trying to make him think that we didn't think he did it. Um, we got him to meet up with us to do a tarot card reading <gasps> for my sister. <clears throat> Despite the emotional stress he was under while being near Chris, Max had the smart idea to record every single thing Chris said to him. Oh! The confession takes begin with Chris doing a tarot reading for Lee, claiming that it will give them an idea of her current situation. This isn't the best reading, kind of the best uh, omen for a reading I've done, but it is fairly positive. I don't see any indication of anything, who would want, any, anything or anyone who would want to harm her or physically impede her in any way. But I do see that when she's coming out of this, she'll be the better for it. I don't know about uh, different, but I think that she will be a changed woman when she comes out of it. I don't, it's the only card that has any bad, uh, I guess you could say bad omen would be the Two of Swords. The Five of Wands is a neutral omen, but it indicates paranoia. So she might be feeling really scared right now, but Aww. the Three of Pentacles and the Poor Lovers girl. are both very positive, as is the, as is the Six of Pentacles. So. I would say there's there's every chance she'll the when she's found it'll be safe and sound. It's possible that one of the reasons Chris enjoys doing these tarot readings is because he's able to get people to listen to him and pay attention to him, something he never got in high school and likely hasn't gotten much of as a young adult. It could also give him a sense of power over others, as some people make decisions about their life utilizing these readings, and it's another way to make them do what he wants. That's a wild. <laughs> okay, that's a wild thing to say about tarot readers. That is crazy. Okay, just because he said this about this guy doesn't mean that all tarot readers are the same. Okay. Give to ask of you. Okay. <laughs> that is a wild roast. A suspect and family sitting here, mm -hmm. but as friends and acquaintances and. A group of people That's that really sweet that her ex-boyfriend was yeah. like helping her brother figure uh, out what had happened to her. Yeah. Instead of me and Max, you know, maybe badgering you with questions, mm -hmm. would you just tell all of us as friends, like once and for good, like just what happened that day while she was there, when she got to your house and just what took place? Okay. For, for our peace of mind. All right. I'm confused why you told me you can't talk about all this. Um, and you're talking about all this. I mean, it's good. Yeah, you are. it's good that you are. This is a but secret recording. 
They would tell me not to talk to you. They wouldn't tell you not to talk to me. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, no. It's hard to explain the uh, things that go on in my head sometimes to someone else, but... Chris, your stories, they didn't add up at all. Not one. You told different things to other people. If you had something not to hide, you would have told the truth the whole time. Here, Doc. Why did you keep things back? Why did the first time you told the story? I will be going forward with the police about this. I haven't yet because I'm trying to find the right way to do it. So this I'm, is the right way right yeah. now. This, this is it. Right this back. is it. I know. But what I say right now, it's going to be very hard. But until I come forward with them to it, it'll be within the week. I swear to you. But I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna have to ask you to keep it to yourselves until then. You tell me right now what happened to my sister. You know what happened to my sister. Yes. You know. If she's alive or if she's dead, you know. I do. Unlike oh. in my original story. Afterwards, she wasn't tired and didn't ask to pass out. She tried to use that to manipulate. She didn't, she wasn't yelling, but she was very venomous. Huh? And she grabbed the knife that I keep by my, <laughs> by my bed. And when we go back, I can show it to you. What she, happened with the knife? She grabbed it and pulled it out and tried to attack me, saying that she would stop attacking me if I agreed to buy drugs for her. She, I don't know, but she was, there was desperation in her eyes. She wouldn't I, do that, dude. She wouldn't do well, that, Chris. Stop lying. She wouldn't I'm not do that. lying. She wouldn't do that. Keep going. Keep going. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm so ridiculous. I am not lying. Okay. She thrust at me twice. I dodged the first one, then I grabbed her hand on the second. And when she thrust again, I turned, grabbed her, and stepped forward and twisted her around so that her body was in between me and the knife. And then I placed my hand at her throat. I didn't start squeezing until after she kept going. I said, I can, we can end this right now. There will be nothing. I won't say anything to anyone. Just please drop the knife. And he said, I'll I let, at and first. I'll let you go. You can get dressed. You can leave and go wherever. And she said that she would stop when, I, when either she was dead or if I agreed to buy her drugs. I told her I did not want that. I told her straight up to please stop and get dressed and go. But she used both of her arms to push against me with the knife, trying to cut my arm to get me to let go so she could keep attacking. So I started squeezing on her throat. There's no way Chris could have positively known Lee's intent in that moment. It's also worth noting that Lee was only 90 pounds, making it hard to believe that Chris was struggling to overpower her and get the knife. This is what makes his story sound just like that, a story. He's decided that the only way out of this is to claim that anything that happened to Lee was in self-defense. Oh. Honestly, she, um, I thought that her muscles would relax she when she went so unconscious. She was so little. And that I could gradually move the knife away and let her go and let her regain consciousness, but that didn't happen. I'm, I've been running through my head trying to figure out why. She kept on fighting and fighting. I kept on telling her to drop the knife and I would stop, drop the knife and I'll stop. You can, and I will leave the room. I'll be waiting out in the patio. You can get dressed, you can go. I won't, I, I'll stop talking to you completely. But she kept shaking her head, no. Adrenaline was rushing through, I didn't, I didn't see her stop shaking her head, but she was still, she was still pushing against my hand. So, but then it was like a rubber band snapped and she just, it just went completely lax. And I, it took me, it took me completely by surprise and I ended up cutting her. It was, it wasn't very deep. It was about an inch, or, inch and a half cut along her sternum. Why that would you not tell someone then? And I if this dropped, was true, why would you I, not tell someone she then? She landed on the floor. I, turned her over to check and make sure she was still alive. I didn't check with on her throat because I had just been grabbing there, so I didn't I didn't think I could get a clear reading off of that. So I checked her wrists and when that didn't when I didn't find anything there, I checked under her arms and then This would be insane well. to hear as her brother. And I keep going back and thinking I could have handled that better, but I just panicked. Although many had suspected it already. This was the first time Lee's death had been confirmed. After she went limp, oh. and I checked the pulse and didn't find anything. So you couldn't call the cops, though? You didn't, you didn't Honestly, I was... Help, like, bring her back, or did she... Well, 
Yeah. What happened after she went limp? Oh. After she went limp, and I checked the pulse and didn't find anything. I, I'll admit it. I was I flat out panicked. After I was coherent enough to start functioning uh, functioning again, I, I'll admit it. I wasn't rational, and I did things that I should not have. I should not have done it, but I covered everything up. Just like we saw with his initial interview, <sighs> Chris is back to using convincing statements. We can hear him using statements like honestly and God's honest truth in order to try and manipulate everyone into believing him. It's honestly? possible that one of the motivations behind this confession is that it's possible he knew the police were on to him and it was only a matter of time before they arrested him. Yeah, her brother has insane self-control. story on Lee's loved ones to, to see if they believed beat him. him up. If they weren't buying it, he would then have some time to adjust his story to make it more believable for police. Chris likely had no idea that he was already being recorded. I took her body and I put her clothes back on. Then I laid her on my bed and covered her in a blanket while I was trying to figure out what what to do. I I didn't wrap her in them or anything like that. I put a bag over her head just to just because even though I kept whispering to her, I'm sorry it came to this Lee. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was sobbing it to her while I was doing this. Ugh. I felt really, I felt guilty over what, what had happened. After I got rid of her, I didn't want the smell to attract anyone. And they were odor, those odor control trash bags. So I figured I'd lay a couple over her. I put a bag over her head. And then I placed two on top of her. Concealing the victim's face Got is often done for a few her. different reasons, but in this case, the only likely reason is due to emotional detachment. Some killers cover their victim's face as a means of distancing themselves emotionally from them. By concealing the face, they might create a psychological barrier to dissociate themselves from the person they have harmed, making it easier to commit the act. Due to Chris's pedantic speech, it's hard to tell if he's being honest. He sounds very dramatic at times, such as when he's talking about sobbing to Lee's corpse, <sighs> as if he's trying to convince the others that killing Lee and hiding her body pained him. The emotion he's trying to portray doesn't match up with the horrifying story he's telling. It's also worth noting that Chris was incredibly meticulous in terms of the steps he took to hide the body, yeah. such as using odor control garbage bags. It's almost as if he had planned this in his mind and in his fantasies for a long time. Afterwards, my roommate walked in. He was, he was early. And I just told him that I had a guest over and that she was sleeping. What? I took, and before he had got home, I had used some rags to clean up the blood and I put those into a grocery bag and I put that into the, into the duffel bag with her. I carried it out. I, and at first I tried the waiting game when two o'clock in the morning rolled around and he hadn't gone to sleep. I, decided to try and sneak it past him. I was taking it out. It? I don't think he would have noticed if I hadn't it. said anything, but if, in case he did notice, I just said I was taking something to my car. But I didn't take her to my car. I I knew that if I was gone for any length of time, he'd get suspicious. So I did the only thing I could think of, and God help me, I put her in the dumpster. It's important to note how Chris repeatedly refers to Lee's body as it. Referring to her as it may allow Chris to forget that this is a human body of a girl he has known oh. since high school, thus letting him distance himself from his own terrifying acts. I know you won't believe me, but I will be turning myself into the police. I will tell them. No, you're going to jail right now. You're going to prison right now. Where do you think you're going, man? See, I'm just going to let you walk away and drive away. You killed my what? goddamn sister. All this recorded. Call the fucking cops. They're already on the way. Having finally heard enough, Max did what likely everyone in his shoes would want to do. He punched Chris. Chris yeah! was forced to call 911 shortly after that, and the police soon arrived to arrest him. He Max was also brought down to the station in order to give a statement to police. He said that she tried to attack him for drug money right. when I was going to give her money, and she knew it. So why would she go that far? She would just be like, I wasn't giving money. Max certainly brings up a good point. It That's makes no sense point. for a 90 pound woman to start a fight with a man who is nearly six foot three when she knew she would be able to buy substances as soon as she met up with her brother. Uh, the first time I talked to him, he told me some right? basic things. She came over, they talked, he, she fell asleep, he looked through her purse, found paraphernalia, not heroin itself, that's a lie. She, there was no actual heroin in her purse. Mm -hmm. Like, 
At least I don't think so, and I really doubt it, because if she had it, she would be trying to kill him for drug money, which that's another inconsistency in his life. She had heroin on her. Again, Max's logic checks out, and it makes sense that he immediately suspected Chris was somehow involved. Aside from pointing out the issues with Chris's story, Max also points out inconsistencies with Chris's character. During his initial interview, Chris made sure to emphasize how much he loved his friends and how he would be willing to sacrifice anything for them. However, Max's interactions with Chris show a different side of him. One thing that specifically pissed me off is because he, was, he messaged me and he was upset that the media went to his house. He was upset at me and my mom because we told the media, the wow. apartment number, which I don't remember us even saying that. So I told him, I was like, I'm really, really sorry. Like, my mom has just said something. She's just worried sick about her daughter. Mm -hmm. You know, like, come on, man. And he's just like, and he says, well, tell your mom, thank you for all the migraines she's given me. And I want, and I hope she gets it. I hope she gets a migraine herself for all the pain she has caused me. Despite Chris claiming that he would do anything for those he cares about, he reveals his profound selfishness when he wishes a migraine on Lee's mother. People with antisocial personality disorder seem to completely delete from their awareness how they contributed to or caused the problem. They only see how other people's actions affect them. Chris's insistence that, that he is a gentleman despite clearly not acting like one could also be an indicator that he has significant grandiosity and narcissism, something that is very typical of people with antisocial personality disorder. It's possible that Chris believed himself to be superior to other guys, i.e. the bad ones who mistreated girls like Lee and his own pregnant girlfriend. This is, of course, a paradox because There's Chris still had long another 30 developed desires minutes to kidnap, of this. assault, and murder. I used to go to high school with him. Okay. Is Kodak there Kodak more Kodak. to this story? Kansas City in the mountains. Oh, all new I've heard that, yeah. This is how she knew him. I mean, were you, how old are you? I'm 21. And he was, I don't know, like 22. So he's a little, he was what like, he's wondering. What else is there? Up, like a small word, like mm -hmm. K through 12. Exactly. No. So I'm already going really fast. It's at 1.25. Hung out, hung out with him. Ever. But it was a small enough school, though, where you did. Yeah, it was just like not once did I ever like give it or anything like that. I wasn't that kind of kid in high school. It's just like I talked to him sometimes, but I never like was like really buddy buddy with him. You know, like he's an acquaintance, he's someone I knew in school. You know, I didn't really faster in high school. And he just looked like he was creepy, and I, you know, that was it for me right there. I talked to his mom like two days ago. Well, I'm curious. Maybe something will pop up. He had thoughts of and killing a certain girl while he was in high school. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to confirm it. All these plans to assault girls demonstrates that Chris was a ticking time bomb. Sadly, his verbalized desires were not taken seriously. Typically, when a person has such morbid thoughts, it's likely not long until they act on them. Oftentimes, they just need to be presented with an opportunity, a situation where they feel they can get away with it. Uh, you described Chris as being creepy in high school. Oh. Can you describe, you know, the, the creepiness, you know, what you know, things that he did that, that would uh, cause people to characterize him as being creepy and weird. No, I've seen him in high school. <laughs> Are you going no, to watch the rest? Because I'm trying to squeeze in a shower before the next one. <laughs> well, so we have 30 minutes left of this video, and we have played up in one hour. So after, if we finish this, I'll try speeding up. If we finish this, then we have, we can watch a 30-minute one. He was, he had mental disability. I don't know exactly what you can tell him. See him, his mom even said that he did. He actually would think. And his mom told me this, and it reminded me, and it totally brought back my memory of, like, when I did go to high school, and I did hear about him. And then he was, he would get frustrated with girls, because he did have baby boarding with him. And I talked to everybody else, so not once. It's too fast! It's too fast! And, uh, he would take, he would think that someone's boarding with him, and he would get really upset and frustrated. He would, change, he would change all the time in high school. Like, one day he was, like, talking a little bit, one day he was just silent. Yeah. This could be an indicator that Chris may have struggled with social cues. It's also possible that he was showing signs of grandiosity beginning in high school, and he wanted to believe that girls found him desirable, only to become frustrated and angry when that didn't turn out to be the case. This may have contributed to Chris gradually developing anger towards girls, which ultimately accumulated and led to him wanting to seek revenge against women in general for not acknowledging him. Oh my With the god! Information he gathered from Max, and now that Chris has confessed, it was time for detectives to once again question him and get to the bottom of what actually happened to Lee. Only this time, he has his attorney with him, much oh. like his confession in the park. Oh, Chris's slow story down, starts slow out similar down. to his original story. Lee came over to hang out. The, the attorney is here. Played some video games, and then Lee kissed him, leading to the two sleeping together. Then afterwards, she wasn't tired, but she did uh, try to sweet talk me into buying drugs for her. She, and when I told her that no, I wouldn't buy her drugs, she escalated from there, trying just regular persuasion, then coercion. She wasn't yelling, but she was very acidic in her words. Chris's nonverbal communication is locked down tight. His hands are tightly clasped, and while it's hard to be certain based on the angle, it looks like his ankles are tightly locked uh, underneath I'm them. I'm playing played up this with Tina, Leslie, and Neil. This indicates a high level of defensiveness and anxiety. 
He's not open it's to the officers at all, night. or even his attorney. And girls' night. I felt this way from the, the was an unplanned thing that was her from the start. I had no other feelings for her beyond that of a friend. And she grabs the knife that I keep by my bed. That knife? Yeah. From where? It was between my bed and wall. She grabbed the knife and pulled it out. And she started threatening me with it. Immediately, there are some issues with Chris's story. First of all, he claims that he has no feelings for Lee other than friendship. However, according right. to his Facebook DMs with Lee, that's not quite true. When Lee was briefly considering moving in with Chris in order to stay off the streets, he told her she could sleep in his bed and that he wouldn't mind having a relationship with her. Lee made it clear that she wasn't interested in Chris, calling into question whether or not she would have actually slept with him, or if this is just another thing Chris is lying about. Additionally, Chris claims that Lee grabbed the duct tape knife he kept between the wall and his bed, considering that this was the very first time Lee had ever been in Chris's room, so it's hard to believe that she would know that the duct tape object poking out from between the mattress and the wall was a knife. Then she started, uh, started thrusting it at me. It yeah. Overhand, Things aren't forward, adding up, I buddy. I kept a firm, but not too firm grip on her hand. We please stop and I'll let you go. You, can, uh, you won't hear anything about this from me to a uh, police report or anything like that. You can grab your, uh, you can get dressed, you can grab your stuff, you can go right now. I won't stop you. And she said, no, it was not going to work out like that. After that, what you did? Um, well, she said, no, if I can't have drugs, then I want to die. It's interesting to note that Chris telling Lee he would let her go free and never speak with her again sounds more like something you would say to someone you had just attacked as opposed to something you would say to someone who is attacking you. Mm -hmm. His hand covering his chest is a protective gesture, which would make sense as he's talking about allegedly being attacked. However, the collarbone is a sensitive area of the body, and covering it could be a subconscious, self-comforting gesture. It may indicate that he's feeling vulnerable or emotionally guarded during this conversation. It could also be an attempt to create a barrier between himself and the detectives, signaling a desire to protect himself because he might not be telling the truth. I guess I was, wasn't paying attention after a while because the adrenaline was getting to me or something. I didn't notice her stop shaking her head, but she was still, I did notice that she was still struggling against my hand. But then after that, I, I let go and I brought her to the floor. I laid her, I laid her back down to the floor and I panicked. I Your hand? Just well, I just want to know what it felt like. Um, I've never, like, held my chest. As Chris continues his story, notice how his feet and body are angled away from everyone Telling else at the table. Telling a story or a this confession. This posture is commonly known as a closed nonverbal cue and could be an indication of discomfort and disinterest as facing towards someone else. I've also never murdered anyone, so maybe that's why. In the conversation. People's feet often point in the direction that they want to go. His feet are aimed away from the room, showing that he wants to leave. What? People can much more easily lie with their hands and mouths than they can with their feet, because we aren't I taught to watch our feet I don't think his feet are thinking lie. that. Now, having heard Chris's story about the fight, the detectives Bro, begin to pick away at his I'm going to be honest. I don't think his feet were thinking that. That is a strange... That's a hyper-analyzing... Hyper-analysis of his feet pointing. I mean... What would you do if he was sitting on this side of the room? Would well, you think his feet are be bent this way? That's wild. That's a stretch. Questionable story. Did you have to after she was dead? No. How do we no. even know the door is in that direction? That's, that's not even anything out of my fantasies, even. I mean, my fantasies from high school have gone pretty dark, and that's that wasn't even there. Man, you say that's not your fantasies. What are your fantasies? They do again, counsel you not to answer the question. Chris asked very oddly when asked this question, where most people would vehemently deny such a disgusting accusation. Chris gives an emotionless no, ew. ew. As he says he said, this, you can actually see him shake his head up and down, almost like he was shaking his head yes while verbally ew. replying no. Once again, indicating that while Chris may be telling the police one answer, he's clearly thinking about another. With Chris bringing up his dark high school fantasies, detectives try to dig a little deeper into his innermost thoughts. When we talked to you the other night, you told us about a couple of girls in high school that you were still angry at. I'm not angry at them now, but I was very angry at them uh, in the past, and when I was in high school. And I knew they were, they were just being kids now, but back then I was very very angry at them and i wrote down 
the things I would like to do to them in the journal. Um, and where's that journal at? The one that you wrote all that stuff in? Is that something you kept? No, I didn't keep it. This might seem a little bit bizarre to you, but are you under any kind of treatment for mental health issues right now? No. Have you ever been? I have. It was because I was having nightmares in the army. And Oh my god, what there, else is there to we're say? There's warnings. Chris did eventually decide to come forward with this information. If you remember, Chris had told Max that he was already planning on turning himself in the week that Max got him to confess. Chris claimed that his tarot cards told him that if he didn't confess, the guilt would eventually destroy him, and he alleged that he was going to take his own life. But Lee's spirit had come to him and told him not to. I, I'm not going to judge it right or wrong, but I do regret what I did, and I keep okay, wishing I'm bored. that I could go back and do it over again. To... All right. I feel like that the first video we watched was so good, and then watching this after was just kind of meh, you know? I feel like this was so unnecessarily long.